Well, good evening, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the My Horse University November 2017 webinar. The presenter this evening is Dr. Stephanie Valberg. Stephanie is the Mary Ann McPhail Dressage Chair in Equine Sports Medicine at Michigan State University. Her research centers on neuromuscular diseases in horses with a special focus on genetic diseases of skeletal muscle and their nutritional management. Please note that you are able to ask questions um, at the end of the presentation via the question and answer button, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We will also be recording this webinar uh, this evening and it will be made available uh, to everyone who has registered uh, later on this week. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Valberg. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here and to, excited to talk about polysaccharide storage myopathy, a disease that's near and dear to my heart. Polysaccharide storage myopathy is one of the forms of muscle disease that's been called tying up or azoturia, Monday morning disease. It's been described in horses for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it was uh, a real problem in the old days when horses were the mechanism of transportation, not just because it was a very painful disorder for the horses, but because it would completely paralyze the transportation industry. This shows you the clinical signs of tying up or the symptoms of tying up. A horse has got sweating, very tight, firm muscles, taking very short strides, usually affects the hind limbs a little more than the forelimbs, and they uh, will lock up in their muscles, which is why it's called tying up, and be very, very reluctant to go forward. And that can be a very painful condition for horses. Dr. McGinnis said, I think very wisely in 1957, that until we truly understand what is happening in the muscle of normal horses as they're exercising, and what's happening in the muscle of horses with tying up as they're exercising, we're really never going to be able to prevent this disease or provide adequate treatments. And that's really been the focus of the research work that we've done, is to try to understand specifically what's happening in the muscle of normal horses, transitioning then to what's happening in the muscle of horses as they're tying up, and then using our knowledge of what is going wrong to pick treatments that are targeted to the exact defect in the skeletal muscle. And one of the big advances that's helped us to understand more about what's going on in the muscle is the development of the muscle biopsy technique. We've been using this technique now to study muscles in horses since the mid-1980s. And we can either use a needle biopsy technique that takes a biopsy in the rump muscle uh, in this area, or veterinarians in the field can use a surgical biopsy of the hamstring muscles shown here that gives us a piece of muscle that we can then freeze and we can study the biochemistry of the muscle and we can study its appearance under the microscope. And we do a lot of sophisticated staining of the muscle samples that we receive. So this shows you what formal infixation looks like, which is what many times uh, pathologists used in the past to study muscle. But in contrast to that, with our frozen sections, we use all of these stains and they allow us to study the metabolism of the muscle. So we can look at the structure and the morphology of the muscle. We can look at nerves within the muscle. We can look at the energy supplied in the muscle in these two Pictures, we see the energy supplied in the form of uh, starch and sugar called glycogen. We can look at the fat content of the muscle with the stains like this. We can look at the powerhouse of energy in the mitochondrial stains, the cytoskeleton of the muscle, and also the fast and slow contriction fibers. We can get an idea of uh, the percentage of slow and fast fibers using some of these stains. So each time we get a muscle biopsy and we get usually between five and 10 biopsies every week, we do this battery of stains to try to understand what's going wrong in the muscle. The other thing that's really advanced our ability to make specific diagnoses is electron microscopy, which just lets us look at a very small portion of the cell and see its ultrastructure, biochemical analyses, and then the advances that we've had in horses running on treadmills and taking muscle biopsies during exercise so we understand the normal way horses respond to exercise and then great advances in recent years in genomics and the study of proteins within the muscle called proteomics. So from all of those studies that we've done over the years and other researchers have done, we know that tying up, uh, also called exertional rhabdomyolysis, which really means the dissolution of striated muscle with exercise, many times it's just a sporadic event that's caused by things in the environment. So it's not necessarily genetic, 
you've got a normal muscle and then something acts upon it to dysfunction like exercising in excess of the amount of training that horses have causing strain to the muscles, imbalances in the diet, in vitamins or minerals, or excessive amounts of grain. All of those things can contribute to tying up in horses. And then there are some horses that will just chronically tie up over and over and over again. And in those cases, we believe that there may be an underlying inherited susceptibility to some of these forms. We know, for example, from work done by Dr. Alleman, that malignant hyperthermia is an inherited disease in quarter horses that impacts the way it regulates calcium within the muscle cell, causing tying up. And in thoroughbred racehorses and in some other breeds that are with racing backgrounds, we see a, a disease called recurrent exertional rhabdomyolysis, or RER, that can cause tying up in those horses. Also, we believe, based on abnormal regulation of calcium in the muscle. What I want to focus on tonight are a group of muscle disorders which we believe impact muscle metabolism and potentially muscle structure in the muscle. And I want to go through what we know about them to date and then where research is heading into these muscle diseases. So the first disease I want to talk about is called type 1 polysaccharide storage myopathy. Polysaccharide is just a term for complex sugars uh, that are stored in the muscle. So we can image the sugars in the muscle in light microscope with a stain that's called PAS, and this shows us the distribution of glycogen within normal muscle cells, and the muscle cells are shown here in uh, cross-section. And then we can also treat this with an enzyme that normally digests polysaccharides called amylase, and then once it's been treated and we stain it again for glycogen, we shouldn't see any glycogen. The glycogen should have been digested away by the amylase. When we started looking at muscle biopsies from horses with tying up, we found in some horses that tied up, not all of them, and mostly to begin with quarter horses, that they had an abnormal sugar in their muscle. So that we saw this very dark granular staining uh, glycogen in the muscle. And we knew that this was abnormal because when we put the enzyme amylase on before the stain, it couldn't digest away all of this sugar. And because of that, because this polysaccharide was accumulating in the muscle, we called this uh, polysaccharide storage myopathy. And we also then went in and biochemically measured how much glycogen was in the muscle of these horses, and we found that they had, on average, twice as much glycogen stored as these horses. So glycogen is the term we use for polysaccharide in skeletal muscle. So it's truly a glycogen storage disease because they are concentrating way too much starch uh, within their skeletal muscle. We suspected, because there were similar sorts of disorders in humans, that this was likely an inherited disease. And so we did a breeding trial over many years using mares that were diagnosed with polysaccharide storage myopathy and donated to the University of Minnesota when I worked there, and then breeding those mares to a normal stallion, who was an Arabian, that did not have abnormal polysaccharide in his muscle. And over the course of time, we had uh, a number of foals. This is showing you the first foal that was born. Her name was polysaccharide. And polysaccharide went on to have a foal called maltose. We had sucrose, we had dextrose. We named all our foals after sweet things. We moved on to candy bars. Um, and then over time, we had three generations of horses that had foals that we wanted to study then in their terms of their muscle development. And we found over the course of years that through the 13 quarter horse or quarter horse cross foals that were born, we had eight of those foals develop abnormal polysaccharide in their muscle. It took two years to see the abnormal polysaccharide buildup in their muscle. So this really wasn't an ideal test because it was impacted by how old the horse was in order to have a diagnosis. And really the only way we had to diagnose it was to perform a muscle biopsy. So having confirmed with this study that it's a genetic disorder, we were interested then in trying to find a genetic test for this disease. We were able to confirm by breeding affected mares to normal stallions and getting affected foals that it's a dominantly inherited disease. And what that means is you just need to get one copy of the disease from either one of your parents and you then have susceptibility to develop this condition. So I'm going to go through a little bit in detail how we determine the genetic basis for this particular disease. So horses have 64 pairs of chromosomes, or 64 chromosomes organized in pairs, and they contain over 20,000 genes. And the trick is to try to find a gene, one of those 20,000 genes, somewhere on those chromosomes 
that might contain a genetic mutation. And then that genetic mutation is going to change the genetic code. And by changing the genetic code, oftentimes it's going to change the amino acid that it codes for. And by changing the amino acid, it's going to alter the function of a protein. So there's a number of different steps that are needed to know that the mutation that you find is actually responsible for disease. And it's harder than you think because if you compare all of the genes sequence in one horse to all of the sequence of another horse, you find 17 million different genetic variations from one horse to other. So there are lots of genetic variations from horse to horse. It's easy to find a genetic variant, but it's really hard to figure out which one of these genetic variants is the cause of a specific disease. So the way that we went to set about doing this was to get muscle biopsy samples from normal horses, and that was key and just wonderful that we had breeders that cooperated with us and allowed us to come out to their farms and biopsy all those horses. And we used this needle technique to take those muscle biopsies so that they could continue to work even after we took the muscle sample. And then we picked the horses that had the lowest glycogens and the most normal looking biopsies we could find. And we picked the horses that had the most abnormal polysaccharide and the highest muscle glycogen concentrations we could find. And we compared genetic markers spread out over all of the chromosomes between these two groups of horses. So we were mapping this to try to figure out what chromosome should we be looking at. And with that strategy, we were able to find uh, area, so variants that were on equine chromosome 10 that were consistently different in the horses that were affected with the disease compared to the normal control horses. So we knew we should be looking on equine chromosome 10. That was huge because that really cuts down on the number of variants that we need to see if they're associated with the disease. Then we looked at the sequence in those regions, and we particularly focused on a gene that was involved in sequencing, in synthesizing glycogen. So it's pretty clear that if you've got an abnormality in a gene that's making glycogen, and the disorder is a storage of excessive amounts of glycogen, that that's a really good candidate for having a genetic mutation. And when we did the sequence, we were able to find that it changed the sequence of the glycogen synthase one gene, and that it also affected the activity of the protein that it produced and the change in the amino acid sequence made that gene function all of the time to make glycogen. So it was turned on, turned on, turned on. It wasn't turning off, and that's why they were storing an abnormal amount of sugar. The next steps that are really important to validate a genetic test are then to go and test another group of horses with polysaccharide storage myopathy and another group of normal horses and make sure you find the same thing in a second population of horses. So we were able to confirm that. We were able to use our breeding herd and confirm that those foals that were affected had the mutation and the foals that weren't didn't have the mutation. And then we published those results so other people were able to then double check our results redo their results with their horses and find that there was a clear association between this genetic mutation and the polysaccharide storage myopathy gene. So then we looked at random sampling of horses of a variety of different breeds and we've looked at thousands of horses at this point. And we found that in our random sample of quarter horse related breeds, so paints, Appaloosas, and quarter horses, about six to eight percent of horses will have one copy of this particular genetic mutation for type 1 polysaccharide storage myopathy. We think the origin of this mutation may have been from a really lovely Belgian horses that were used to create heavier horses to carry knights and armor way back um, long, long ago, and that these horses were incorporated into North American draft horses like the Percheron and the Belgian, and they have very, very high frequency of this genetic mutation for PSSM1 at 62% in Percherons and 39% of Belgians will have this mutation. Interestingly, if you have draft horses that were derived from the United Kingdom, like Clydesdales and Shires, we have almost no horses that show up with the genetic mutation for PSSM1, and we don't see this genetic mutation in light breed horses. So we've seen it in over 20 different breeds, but they're very specific breeds of horses. What does this genetic mutation do? Well, why is that important? It's important because then we can devise targeted treatments. And so as I mentioned, when they have a mutation in the enzyme called glycogen synthase, it's turned on all of the time. And we need to try to decrease the amount of glycogen and free it up so it can be metabolized. And one way we know we can do this now is to make sure that the horses are eating as little starch and sugar as possible. And then they will have a less insulin secretion and we know insulin turns this gene on 
So by removing insulin stimulation and having a low starch and sugar diet, we can try to enhance uh, the glycogen that's available for metabolism. We also know that we need to be able to burn glycogen. We have to teach the muscle to be able to burn it. And we also have to teach the muscle to be able to burn fat as a fuel, and that requires exercise. So we require regular daily exercise in these horses to enhance its ability to burn glycogen as fuel. And then we also provide some extra dietary fat, and that gives us an energy source outside of glycogen so that the muscle can function properly. So all of these things help to contribute to uh, improving the way that PSSM1 horses are able to exercise. The biggest challenge with trying to manage the diets of these horses is that they store lots of fuel in their muscles and they're kind of easy keepers oftentimes. And that means that we don't want to give a lot of fat and too many calories to a horse that's overweight. So we have learned that hay that has less than 12% of starch and sugar in the muscle, that's called non-structural carbohydrate, that won't stimulate insulin. So that's the recommendation we have for choosing a hay and measuring the amount of starch and sugar in that hay. And then we've learned that if horses are overweight, you can actually provide fat by fasting them before you exercise them. And then they're burning their own fat. You're not adding calories and you're helping to get them down into a normal weight. And horses always need a balance of vitamin minerals. So we, and there are many of those that are made for horses that are overweight, like horses for, with equine metabolic syndrome. So you can buy a, a good ration balancer for these horses. And then we also uh, want them to be moving around. We want them to get regular exercise, but we don't want to have too much sugar in the grass. So if the grass is lush uh, and they're out on a pasture, we usually recommend for overweight horses a grazing muzzle. If horses are a normal weight um, and they're participating in exercise, one of the ways to be able to feed them with the lowest amount of uh, calories but lots of fat in the muscle is to, again, use a ration balancer or to use some alfalfa pellets or hay cubes and provide oil on top of those hay cubes. Or you can provide one of the solid fat supplements that are available or rice bran, and that helps to provide fat on a low starch and low sugar diet. There are special feeds that are available for horses with polysaccharide storage myopathy, and those concentrates work well for horses that are in modded to heavy exercise. And the reason for that is that they have a specific amount of fat, and you have to feed quite a lot of that concentrate in order to provide the amount of fat that's going to benefit these horses. And if you're feeding less than the amount that's recommended on the feed bag, then they're not getting the balance of vitamin and minerals they need, and they're not getting the amount of fat that's going to make them feel comfortable when they exercise. So if you are looking at a feed product and you read the feed bag and it says that you should feed five pounds, and you think, my gosh, that's going to make my horse really overweight, then that's not the right choice for you. Because if you feed less of it than recommended on the feed bag, then you're not getting the adequate amount of fat and they're not getting a balance of vitamin and minerals. So then you need to look for another source. So if all of these... Uh, recommendations sound a bit confusing. What I recommend is to use a nutritionist and help, have them help you develop a diet. That's something that they're experts in. I use nutritionists all the time to balance the diets because I'm not a nutritionist and I don't do the details of these diets. And so there are many of them that are available through feed companies or independently that can help you develop a ration for PSSM1 horses. I want to emphasize though that the diet alone doesn't fix these horses. If you just change the diet and you don't exercise the horses regularly and provide them with a lot of turnout, it doesn't improve the way their muscles function. So it's a combination of both the diet changes and exercise. And for type 1 PSSM, it can be as little as 10 minutes of exercise a day that we've shown is beneficial for the way their muscles function. So it's really strongly recommended that the horses get to move around as much as they can every day and that they get some form of regular exercise. And usually once you've got the horses in shape, you can give them a day or two off uh, a week, but you really have to kind of work your way up to that before you start giving them time off. And if they're off, it's really good if they're outside. So now that we have a genetic test and we don't need to do muscle biopsies to diagnose type 1 PSSM, we've discovered that there are quite a few horses that are positive for the genetic test but don't necessarily have clinical signs. And many times uh, that's specific to certain breeds. So for example, we mentioned that 69% of Percherons have the genetic mutation, but 69% of those horses aren't tying up. 
and uh, a review of the prevalence in, for example, gypsy vanners or halflingers, about 18% of those horses have the genetic mutation. And there have been some nice studies done in halflingers to show that those horses with the genetic mutation don't necessarily have any clinical signs of the, of the disease. So that's not because the test is inaccurate. The test is accurate in detecting the base pair sequence defect in the DNA. It's that there are a lot of different things that interact with that particular gene mutation to cause the clinical signs. As we mentioned, diet, exercise interact with them. There are other genes, like the gene for malignant hyperthermia, that can make the signs much worse. And then there's 20,000 other genes in the body which interact with the glycogen synthase and, and can impact that. And this fact that it doesn't always penetrate, it doesn't always cause clinical signs, that's true for almost every genetic mutation. So that they don't always, uh, they give you a susceptibility to a genetic disease and to developing clinical signs, but it doesn't necessarily always doom you to having the worst clinical signs associated with that genetic mutation. It's just common biological variation. So what we did when we had the genetic test then was we went back and we screened all the muscle biopsies that we had ever diagnosed with polysaccharide storage myopathy to see if all of those muscle biopsies had the genetic mutation. And we found that this result was impacted by breed um, and that some breeds had more horses that had the genetic mutation and some breeds had less, even though they all had been diagnosed by a muscle biopsy with polysaccharide storage myopathy. So for example, we would find abnormal polysaccharide without the glycogen synthase 1 mutation causing PSSM1 in about 28% of quarter horses that we had previously diagnosed with PSSM. In 90% of the worm bloods we'd previously diagnosed with PSSM did not have this genetic mutation, so there's something else going on in worm bloods. Likewise, 100% of Arabians do not have this genetic mutation, so there's something else going on that's causing abnormal polysaccharide in these breeds. So we're left at a point where what are we gonna call this then? And that's where we came up with the term type one PSSM and type two PSSM. Type one PSSM is very specific for the genetic mutation GYS1 that causes polysaccharide storage myopathy type one. Type two really means all of the biopsies and all of the results that we had that aren't consistent with being type one PSSM. It's not a specific disease yet because we don't have a specific cause. It's just the group of muscle biopsies that have abnormal polysaccharide that are not, uh, do not possess this glycogen synthase 1 mutation. So type 1 PSSM is now the term we use for muscle biopsies that are characterized by this abnormal amylase-resistant polysaccharide, plus they have to have the genetic mutation. And that's a very specific way to diagnose this disease is to run the genetic test. Type 2 PSSM is reserved for those horses that have abnormal looking biopsies when we look at the stains, but they don't have the glycogen synthase 1 mutation. So in this case, we have a biopsy that's got this abnormal glycogen. And in this case, it happens to be amylase resistant. That's a pretty easy diagnosis for polysaccharide storage myopathy. We would then do the genetic test. The genetic test is negative, and so it's called type 2 PSSM. The biopsies that are trickier uh, to diagnose and much more difficult to interpret that have type 2 PSSM are biopsies like this, in which you have these small little granules of polysaccharide that don't look completely normal, but they're sensitive to amylase digestion. And so the specificity of this diagnosis is not as high. It's more subjective interpretation. You can have false positives uh, that it can occur because this isn't really a very severe change in the muscle. And this is one of the reasons why we don't recommend taking a muscle biopsy of a normal horse to see if it has type 2 PSSM or using the muscle biopsy to decide if you're going to breed your horse or not is this change that we're seeing in the PAS stain is not usually specific enough to be able to just say yes, positive, and yes, negative, in the way a genetic test can be. It's a more subjective diagnosis, and we only recommend taking the muscle biopsies from horses that have clinical signs that are consistent with polysaccharide storage myopathy. So what we're trying to do now then is let's figure out what causes type 2 PSSM, or what uh, there may well be several causes that are specific to specific breeds. 
So we're starting to analyze our muscle biopsy samples by breed and not assuming that they all have the same disease. And the next step we wanted to take then was to go through all of our records uh, from veterinarians that had submitted the muscle samples and get a clear description of type 2 PSSM symptoms from the veterinarians based on the paperwork that was submitted with muscle biopsies. So I'm going to walk through those results. The next thing we wanted to do then was to query owners and get a clear clinical description of the disease from the owners. Nobody fusses more about their horse and understands more about their horse uh, than a horse owner does. They're very, very observant about individual horses. So we wanted to make sure that we would capture owner input to describe a type 2 PSSM. And then we're working very hard to develop more specific diagnostic tests and to try to dissect this out and find specific diseases. And as I mentioned before, one of the things that's most difficult to obtain are muscle samples from healthy horses. We have to be able to compare diseased horses to healthy horses. So if any of you are listening and any of you are interested in us using this little needle tool to come out and get muscle samples from healthy worm bloods, that would really assist our research. So the first description I want to give is a paper that was actually just published this month, which uh, summarizes the findings from veterinarians and the submissions from muscle biopsies. What we did was go back through all of the muscle biopsies in our database. So we have about 3,600 muscle biopsies. We looked at them by breed. So we selected 581 horses that were classified as warm blood. So a warm blood was, by definition, whatever breed the the veterinarian had filled in on the form and included some draft crosses. And then we looked up their results of genetic testing. If they had abnormal polysaccharide and they were positive for this glycogen synthase 1 mutation, we called this type 1 PSSM. And you can see that that's very uncommon. Out of 581 biopsies, only 16 were diagnosed with type 1 PSSM amongst warm bloods. Then we picked out those horses that were diagnosed with PSSM but that did not have the GYS1 mutation that had some abnormal looking polysaccharide in the biopsy and um, looked at these as type 2 PSSM. And then we had a large number of warm bloods that did not have either type 1 or type 2 PSSM. We also looked at uh, warm blood breeds. They're by far the majority of horses in the biopsy database. There were 3,000 of those, and many of these were quarter horse related breeds. And we uh, divided them up in a similar fashion into those with type 1 um, and those with type 2 PSSM based on how the uh, glycogen staining looked and whether or not they had the genetic mutation. And when we look at this by breed then, if we look at the uh, non-warm bloods, which as I mentioned were largely quarter horses, the most common clinical sign is tying up in these horses or rhabdomyolysis. 60% of quarter horses that have type 2 PSSM will present with a history of tying up. And in many cases that's confirmed by showing a leakage of a protein called CK that should normally be in the muscle and not in the bloodstream. When they took a blood sample, they'd find increases in that CK within the bloodstream showing that they had muscle damage. So the common presentation with quarter horses is tying up. Some of them have an abnormal gait like lameness, some of them have a bit of atrophy, and some of them uh, shiver or tremble when they have episodes of tying up. So this is the same data that I just showed you, what we commonly see in quarter horses, and we're going to contrast that with the warm bloods that were diagnosed with type 2 PSSM. And we find a much smaller proportion of warm bloods with type 2 PSSM actually have tying up, only about 26% according to the veterinarians uh, that submitted the muscle samples. They still have atrophy, they still ha have uh, shaking and trembling, some of them have episodes of shivers, but most commonly they have a gait abnormality. So um, a vague kind of lameness, and an alteration in the way that they're moving, and that's one of the big differences between type 2 PSSM and warm bloods and quarter horses, that it's this difference in the way they're moving that's the primary sign that you see in warm blood horses. And we also found that they have a less consistent elevation in the blood CK activity, which means that they don't have muscle damage as frequently as, frequently as you'll see in quarter horses. When we look more closely at what, what do they mean by a gait abnormality, it appeared that they had a, a mild hind limb lameness. Sometimes it shifted from one leg to the other. The owners often initially suspected it was a stifle lameness, but veterinarians had gone through and looked at them very, very closely. They'd done bone scans or nuclear scintigraphy to try to figure out where in the hind limb this might be. And they ruled out 
ligaments and, and joints and just had no specific uh, cause localized for that hind limb lameness. And that's what led them to do the bustle biopsy after that workup and the diagnosis of PSSM2 occurred based on the biopsy of these horses. So I want to make the point that the place to start when you've got a horse that has a gait abnormality is by trying to understand what's going on with the uh, training issues, saddle fit, lameness, if they've got uh, hawk disease, problems with their stifles, sacroiliac, or back pain, those are the most common reasons why horses can have a gait abnormality. And that's the place to start. If you've ruled out all of those diseases, then you might think about doing a muscle biopsy. And that's for two reasons. One is because these other issues are more common causes of gait abnormalities than type 2 PSSM. And also because, as I mentioned, this uh, evaluation of the glycogen storage in the muscle can be subjective. And so you want to make sure that you're looking at a horse that has a very high likelihood of having type 2 PSSM when you take the muscle biopsy, uh, and rather than just starting with the muscle biopsy. Uh, and then if that comes back negative, moving to uh, the lameness exam. Because you can have horses that will are on the upper end of normal looking glycogen, and they'll come back with a mild PSSM diagnosis, but in fact, what's wrong with them may not be the muscle. You may have missed one of the orthopedic causes of lameness in these horses. So the next question that we wanted to ask was, we've made recommendations to horses with PSSM long before we ever knew about the genetic uh, cause of type 1 PSSM. We've always made the same recommendations for type 1 PSSM. It turns out as for type 2 PSSM. We've done studies to show that type 1 PSSM recommendations uh, work very, very well, but we really don't know. We haven't done any, didn't have any data to know whether or not the recommendations that were largely based on the abnormality in horses with type 1 PSSM were going to be effective for type 2 PSSM. So this is a study that uh, we've just completed and we submitted for publication and I, I wanted to present to you today. And the reason this is so important is because we've done a lot of diet trials uh, and we've had uh, our herd of horses, we've tried different diets, we've put them on the treadmill, we've done a lot of standardized work trying to figure out how can we make these horses functional. Uh, members of society. And all of those trials, it turned out, were done on horses with type 1 PSSM. So those clinical trials are great for assessing that, but they really weren't helpful in trying to figure out if the diet was good for horses with type 2. And I want to mention that the work done for this survey was all done by uh, Zoe Williams, who's a, a second year veterinary student here at Michigan State University and has been working in the lab for two years. And she did uh, the bulk of the work here trying to get horse owners to provide us with this information. And the answers that we wanted to get were to the questions of what are the clinical signs of PSSM reported by owners? We know what the veterinarians recorded on the sheets, but owners living with these horses from day to day would have a lot of insights we wanted to capture. And then we wanted to know whether they felt like these clinical signs improved with the recommendations that we had provided once they got a muscle biopsy diagnosis and those recommendations were for changes in both diet and exercise regimes. So the recommendations that were received in writing included the low starch fat supplemented diet, the same one I described for type 1 PSSM. We added an additional recommendation that if horses had evidence of muscle atrophy, that they should consider adding a protein supplement. And usually we recommend an amino acid supplement um, that can be added to try to enhanced muscle bulk. We recommended that horses uh, warmed up with a long low frame and I wanted to show you what that looks like. So using Vienna reins or using neck stretcher or using Pessoa or like um, system, teaching the horse that they should just be able to stretch down as you're warming the horses up on the lunge line and we allow the horses to just trot at slower speeds. They don't have to really engage to start with. We're trying to get them to use all their paraspinal muscles, find all their limbs and where they are in space, and to stretch out the top line muscles so they've got a good uh, warm up in that way. And we encourage people to do that several times a week, particularly if their horses are sore over their top line. We recommended that they make sure that horse gets exercised every day if possible, even if that's just in the form of turnout. 
and that when they're riding, as they start to collect their horse, that they give the horse frequent breaks and ability to stretch. So to all of you that answered our questionnaires, I just want to uh, say thank you, thank you, thank you. I know that we harassed you. <laughs> we started out by going through the biopsy database and identifying the veterinarians that submitted biopsies and trying to identify then contact information from owners, where sometimes we had contact information that was provided on the biopsy submission sheet. And Zoe went through um, and sent out emails to all of the owners. She made phone calls to try to identify owner contact information. We tried to identify um, addresses for those that didn't respond to emails and mailed out um, paper copies. And one of the really important components of this study was to ask the owners not only to fill out information for themselves, but to ask a friend or if they had a healthy horse to answer the same questions for their control horse. Because we really wanted to make sure that the signs they were reporting for PSSM horses were specific to PSSM2 and not just general problems that we see on average in, in our horse population. So about a third of the people that we contacted responded to us. We had 42 horses with PSSM that were warm bloods and 22 control horses. And unfortunately, we only had uh, 17 owners of quarter horses with type 2 PSSM that responded and they provided uh, 14 uh, control horses. And fortunately, these uh, control and affected horses were nicely balanced for age and nicely balanced for uh, sex as well. So they were good comparisons to make between the PSSM2 and the control horses within breeds. So what this is showing you is the data for the quarter horses. There were 16 responses when we asked, what are the specific signs that you're seeing in the horses? And this is showing you the percentage of these 16 horses that had the clinical signs that were common to these horses. So for example, before any recommendations um, were made, 63% of the horses had a decline in performance, 63% of them showed signs of tying up, 58% of them had a change in behavior, we saw a difficulty with leads and canter transitions, mild lameness, sensitivity to grooming, and resentment to saddlement, and some of them had, about a third of them had top line atrophy. So as I mentioned, it was really good to have a control group because we wanted to compare then, these are the common signs of type 2 PSSM possibly, but these signs need to be specific to PSSM2 horses and, and they need to be different from what we see in our control population. So what we've learned from this is that lots of horses have difficulty with leads and canter transitions. I can testify to that from personal experience. Uh, lots of horses will have mild lamenesses, lots of horses resent saddling and top line atrophy. These are common problems to horses. They're not specific signs for quarter horses with type 2 PSSM. Tying up was specific uh, to PSSM2 and quarter horses. A change in behavior, particularly a change uh, in behavior towards being exercised was common. And uh, horses seem to be more sensitive to grooming in the quarter horses with type 2 PSSM. So it's good to know that these are the signs that are associated with it. And these are common signs that we see in many horses that are not necessarily PSSM2 specific. This is showing you then the signs that were specific kind of in brown. And then it's comparing the signs that they had before they took the muscle biopsy and got the diagnosis and after implementing uh, diet and exercise recommendations. Again, it's only 16 uh, horses because that's the number of responses we had in quarter horses. But we had a remarkable decline in uh, tying up with the diet and exercise regime. So only one horse still had episodes of tying up with our recommendations. So that was really heartening to know that this was very helpful for tying up. Their behavior improved, their performance improved, uh, and we saw actually a better canter transitions and uh, picking up the correct lead, and we saw less top line atrophy with the changes that we recommended. So there was some sig significant improvement. The diet does seem to help quarter horses with type 2 PSSM and the exercise. So then we looked at this in warm blood horses. We had 42 warm bloods, and we saw comparisons between before the muscle biopsy and implementing recommendations uh, compared to controls. And one of the big things that type 2 PSSM warm bloods have that wasn't exactly described in quarter horses is a reluctance to go forward. So you get on, you put your leg on, you're expecting your horse to respond and move off your leg, 
and you don't get that response. So 74% of the time that was the complaint. And that was associated with a, uh, a decline in performance. A change in behavior with exercise was also pretty common in these horses, different from our controls. They had signs of tying up, although they weren't always associated uh, with measured elevations in muscle enzymes like CK in the bloodstream, and they weren't nearly as common as what we saw in quarter horses, so something that was uh, in line with what veterinarians were reporting. And more of these horses with type 2 PSSM had less muscle on their top line than control horses. But again, uh, leads and canter transitions are just common amongst uh, horses. Mild lamenesses were common. Resenting saddling was common. These signs were not specific um, to PSSM2 in warm bloods either. When we asked a general question in the warm bloods, um, do you feel that your horse has improved with our recommendations? It was heartening to know that 80% of owners felt that their horses had improved and had significantly fewer clinical signs. Um, and 70% of owners associated that with a uh, change in the exercise that was very helpful, and 85% of them felt that it was the change in the diet that was also uh, very helpful. So we're heartened to know that we can improve warm blood horses with type 2 PSSM with the diet and exercise recommendations that we've developed. However, when you look specifically at the clinical signs, when 74% sorry, 74% of horses were reluctant to go forward before the diagnosis, there's still 36% of them that are reluctant to go forward afterwards. So they've improved, but there's still about a third of these horses that are having issues with reluctance to go forward. Again, their performance is improved, um, the change in behavior is improved, there are fewer signs of tying up, um, and we didn't see any significant differences in these other clinical signs. So this was, to me, the most troubling aspect of this is we can improve them, but we're not fixing them necessarily. And when we asked owners what they felt, they said 53% uh, of horses were not advancing as expected in training. And it's this reluctance to go forward, uh, swishing of the tail, uh, lack of engagement of the hindquarter, pinning of the ears, and no sense that your horse is moving off when you put your leg on that is uh, particularly troubling and frustrating for riders. And it's troubling because you can't really tell whether it's because the horse has got a behavioral issue. You can't really tell if it's because it's painful and it doesn't want to go, because you're getting a lot of advice from a lot of different people on how to try to make your horse go forward. And because it's not always consistent. Some days you might have a really great ride and other days the horse is, is uh, not wanting to go forward. So to me, this is probably the most frustrating thing about riding a horse or owning a horse that has um, type 2 PSSM. So where are we at then? Well, well, to make better recommendations, we really need to know exactly what causes PSSM2. If we knew exactly what the cause was, we could try to tailor our recommendations. But knowing what we know now, it seems like the PSSM1 recommendations are helpful. So providing a diet that's low in starch and sugar. But because we don't have a specific mutation like glycogen synthase 1, I'm not sure that with PSSM2 horses, you need to stress as much about really getting the starch and sugar as low as you can. I'm not sure that you need to soak the hay to get the sugar really, really, really low. I think they tolerate, in my opinion, uh, experience more starch and sugar than you might have in a PSSM1 horse. Fat supplementation for horses that aren't fat seems to provide uh, an extra bit of energy that can be helpful in these horses. And if they've got any top line issues, I really think that the new amino acid supplements that are coming out for top line are very beneficial in these horses. So there are a number of uh, products that are out there now, uh, top line extreme by progressive, super sport, by Purina, Neutrina has a new top line product. I think these amino acid supplements can benefit horses particularly if they don't have good top line muscle. Avoiding the sugars in lush grass, uh, many people felt like lush pasture was detrimental to their horses. Ensuring that your horse has got enough uh, serum vitamin E, it's a good idea to check it. You don't necessarily have to supplement if the levels are normal, but making sure they don't get deficient is important. Providing them regular exercise and daily turnout, um, and then using some of the long, low warm-up techniques, particularly if their back's sore or they don't want to engage their hind end. So these are the recommendations that we've made, and we've got a lot more information on our website, the Neuromuscular Diagnostic Labs uh, website on 
how to deal with uh, PSSM2. Just want to uh, give you a little bit more information too about long and low. Uh, this is a horse that's a little bit sway backed and really uh, benefited from being worked like this. Again, we're not driving them forward at this point in time and we're using our voice to tell them every time they've got a nice long low head carriage that they're doing well and they're good. And in this case, you can see we're using a neck stretcher rather than Vienna reins. So using this technique for you know 10 minutes uh, before you ride, sometimes 15 minutes before you ride, a little bit of walk, a little bit of trot, can be really helpful in stretching out um, that top line and just giving them a, a bit of time to figure out where all their limbs are. So that's what we're, where we're at with uh, type two PSSM. I wanna transition a little bit now to talk about um, another myopathy that might be related to type, type 2 PSM or may not be uh, called myofibrillar myopathy. Uh, we've done some work in warm bloods with this and also in conjunction with uh, Carrie Finno at University of California Davis and Erica McKenzie at Oregon State University. We've done a lot of work recently in Arabian horses. And I'm gonna talk about this disease in Arabian horses at the AERC meeting in Reno coming up in March. And then I'm going to propose that might, we might do another webinar on Arabian horses um, after that. So if you're interested in Arabians and endurance horses, stay tuned. We're also in the process of doing um, a survey for endurance horses on tying up. So please, please, please respond to us and answer this. the uh, questionnaire that we ask. The more responses we get, the more scientific information we have, the better we can understand what's going on in Arabian horses. So I'm just gonna review a little bit what we found in warm blood horses. This disease has many of the same clinical signs as we described in type two PSSM. Horses just don't push off behind. They look uncomfortable. They're not using their back. Um, and it's a very intermittent phenomena. They get worse as they get older usually. Um, and they just don't wanna go forward. They don't wanna push with their hind end. Now, many times a horse that has an issue like that might have a lameness in their hind end. So you don't want to assume just because your horse trots like this that it's got PSSM. You want to make sure that there isn't a suspensory, a hawk, a stifle, a sacroiliac, uh, kissing spines, some other lesion that's making them sore behind. But this is uh, what horses that have myofibrillar myopathy can look like. So as I mentioned earlier, what we've been trying to do is find better ways to classify these muscle disorders. And maybe some of that is through looking at different stains we can do in the skeletal muscle. And with myofibrillar myopathy, what we're looking at now is a stain that uh, provides the mechanical support inside the cell. And the stain is for a particular cytoskeletal element called Desmond. This is showing you a little piece of a muscle cell with a cell membrane up here. And these are the contractile proteins uh, that are organized in a very, very regular fashion in order for muscle to be able to contract and shorten. And then they have to be all held together and they have to be attached to the cell membrane. And that occurs by a protein called Desmond that holds the organelles in place, it holds the contractile filaments in place, and it keeps them anchored to the cell membrane. So we wanted to look at this because we had a suspicion that there might be a problem with the way that all of this was organized within the skeletal muscle. And this is showing you a Desmond stain from a horse that has myofibrillar myopathy. The normal staining muscle cells that are running longitudinally look like this. And then we had certain cells where we had a much darker Desmond stain, which we think represents clumping of Desmond. So rather than Desmond just having a nice uh, straight line here, we've got these clumps of Desmond that are occurring, either because the protein is misfolding, because there's a weakness here, or because when the misfolded protein occurs, it's not getting cleared or taken away. So the reason we're calling this myofibrillar myopathy is because the myofilaments that make up the contractile proteins seem to have an instability. Another way we can look at this is to do electron microscopy, and that just goes in and looks at a little bit of a portion of one muscle cell to get an up-close look at these contractile proteins or myofilaments. And that's what I'm showing you here, is a little piece of one cell, and these are all of the contractile proteins so beautifully aligned, and they have these Z-discs or Z-discs 
um, that are aligned and anchor all of the myofilaments. This is a normal horse. This is a horse with myofibrillar myopathy. And what we see is the myofilaments are broken. And so you just get glycogen that's filling in the space here, which is probably why it looks like type 2 PSSM, because you've got clumps of glycogen forming where the breaks occur. And again, you can see here right through the Z disc, there's a rip. And then we have a break here. And this is interestingly enough, a lot of times these abnormalities in the Z disc is what you see if you've overtrained. When you've got that real soreness two or three days after exercise, the muscles will have abnormalities in the Z discs that have to get repaired in order for you to be stronger and be able to withstand that type of exercise the next time around. And I'm wondering if that's the reason why those horses move so abnormally. It's because they ache and they're sore. They haven't tied up and damaged the cell membrane, I don't think. They've just um, broken some of these contractile proteins, and that's creating that really achy feeling that makes them not want to work and not want to go forward. So we don't know at the point, this point in time uh, what causes myofibrillar myopathy. We've got some... Um, research that's cooking to try to understand exactly what the basis for this is. Um, it's possible that this is a more severe form of PSSM2. We're not going to know that till we have the base underlying basis of this uh, hammered out, um, but we should have some more information about this in the future. We're recommending the same sort of treatment as PSSM2 for these horses um, that includes the amino acid supplements and regular exercise. I think particularly when they've got the breaks in the myofilaments like this, they need to regenerate all of those contractile proteins. So providing them with an amino acid supplement around uh, 45 minutes before or after the time of exercise helps turn those proteins over and helps provide them with the, the building blocks that they need to build up their muscle mass. You may need more antioxidant therapy, so you certainly want to make sure that they've got enough um, vitamin E. And we can improve some of these horses, but a lot of times the residual signs impact their performance. They just don't want to go forward. They're not moving off your leg. They're reluctant to collect. And then following some of them along, um, a number of them have been euthanized uh, just because of their performance limitations. A number of them have switched from uh, the hope that they'd be a dressage horse to becoming a hunter-jumper. Um, and moving to trails or, or professions where they don't really need to push very hard with their hind end. So just to summarize then, the uh, quarter horses, the clinical signs we see in quarter horses that we've diagnosed with type 2 PSSM are largely related to tying up. Um, some of them will have a bit of a, a gait abnormality. They tie up, they have high serum CK activity, and um, we can fix those horses quite nicely with a same diet that we're using for type 1 PSSM when it's combined with regular exercise. What we're seeing in warm bloods is this uh, decline in performance, are reluctant to go forward, uh, a change in behavior associated with exercise, less frequent tying up than what we're reporting in quarter horses, less common that they have elevations in CK in their bloodstream, and more commonly they'll have some degree of muscle atrophy. And Maybe a severe form of this is the myofibrillar myopathy, or maybe myofibrillar myopathy is, is something different. So I just want to give you a personal story about whether PSSM2 is, is the most likely reason that your horse won't go forward or the most likely reason that your horse um, doesn't want to exercise. I'm showing you a video of my own horse who uh, developed these clinical signs. Of course, if you're researching a disease, your horse develops these signs. Reluctant to go forward, uh, reluctant to bend, not wanting to engage his hind quarters, and then this type of behavior he exhibits right here, where he will let you know in no uncertain terms that he doesn't enjoy the exercise that you're asking him to do. So, what do you do with a horse like this? Do you take a muscle biopsy or do you test it for type 2 PSSM? Fortunately for my horse, I took my horse to a veterinarian and I had my veterinarian fully evaluate my horse for lameness. And he has uh, spavin. He has bone spavin in his hind legs. And when his hocks get sore, he gets angry and he doesn't want to exercise. And if you try to make him do it, he'll react. But if you treat his hocks, uh, he will within four or five days be a happy, cooperative horse um, and go back to exercising normally. A couple of times we've had issues with his back, and that turned out his saddle didn't fit. Uh, we've changed uh, saddles, and he is now a happy camper as long as I take care of him. 
If I just assumed he had PSSM and I just changed his diet and kept him regular exercise, he'd still be an unhappy camper and we'd still be struggling. So I really encourage you not to assume that any horse that has these clinical signs has type 2 PSSM. I encourage you to make sure that you rule out all of these other more common co problems of uh, reluctance to go forward and exercise intolerance. So what we really would like to have would be a genetic test for type 2 PSSM or a genetic test for myofibrillar myopathy. And as a scientist, I feel it's very important that genetic tests uh, that are offered and used are scientifically validated. So personally, I only use those tests where I can answer the following questions. What specific gene are we testing for? What is the mutation? What's the base pair change in the gene? What does that mutation do? Does it change the protein structure? Does that change make sense with what we know about the disease itself? How commonly do you find that mutation associated with the best characterized disease, so with horses that have abnormal polysaccharide in their muscle? And how commonly do you see it in healthy horse populations? How many horses have been tested? Um, and you know, is this breed specific? Does it, does it follow a specific breed? And if you can answer all those questions, then that uh, data can easily be published. When it's published, then people can verify it, it can be validated. If we know exactly what the specific genes are, we can start to target our treatments towards what's wrong with the muscles and improve these horses. And so true disease-causing variants that are identified and, and offered for genetic testing, they should stand up to that type of scrutiny. And just to reiterate, if you compare the DNA of one horse to the DNA of another horse, we can find 17 million different variants from one horse to the other. It's not hard to find a variant. It's just really hard to pin down what specific variant is associated with a specific disease. So I really want to thank everybody who answered our, our questionnaires. It's just so incredibly valuable to hear from you. As I said, you live with these horses, you understand what you're going through, you understand what your horse is going through, and by assimilating all that information and comparing it to healthy horses, it really helps us understand the disease and helps us um, move forward. We really need to look at uh, healthy horses, so any of you that are willing to um, offer a large group of horses where we would be able to take the muscle biopsies from them and establish uh, a sample base of control horses would be terrific. I want to thank uh, our referring veterinarians who are regularly submitting the muscle biopsy samples that help us understand these horses. Marianne McPhail and the endowment of the McPhail Equine Performance Center that has funded a lot of the research into warm bloods and, and problems with dressage horses. And Zoe Williams was a Boringer Ingelheim Veterinary Summer Scholar student working on this project this summer uh, and also partially funded by Michigan State University. So with that I'm going to conclude and I would be happy to answer any questions. All right so if you have any questions uh, you should see a Q&A feature towards the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and click on that and go ahead and type your questions in there and uh, we'll go ahead and, and take those questions. So we'll give you all just a minute to to add your questions in there. And um, while we're waiting for them to come through, I just want to thank Dr. Valbert for uh, her presentation this evening and thank all of you for joining us tonight as well. Um, I will mention that we are going to be sending all of you a survey. And uh, in the survey, we're just looking to get some feedback about tonight's webinar and also to help us to plan future webinars as well. Uh, looks like we do have a question okay. here. One of the questions was how does shivering um, displayed by PSSM horses differ from that shown from true shivering horses? I think it, it differs a lot. I think a lot of times what people were describing as shivering is that horses were having um, muscle tremors in their hind end, so they were shaking and trembling potentially from muscle pain, whereas with uh, the classic shivers, the abnormality is defined by having difficulty backing up, uh, and that's not something that we see necessarily with horses with PSSM. The confounding factor there, of course, too, is, as I mentioned, the specificity of the muscle biopsy diagnosis. Sometimes uh, we might have confused 
uh, a positive diagnosis of PSSM on muscle biopsy in horses with true shivers just because we can have false positives. But the clinical signs that are classically associated with true shivers is that horses will be reluctant to back up and they'll either hyperflex a hind limb or they'll extend the hind limbs so um, straight that they won't be able to back up and then they may resent picking up their hind limbs but then when you walk them forward for the most part they walk forward completely normally and they horses with shivering true shivers they exercise fine they're forward off your leg they don't have any signs of exercise intolerance and i uh, it would be we would be honored to come to your farm and to look at um controlled horses. So if you could contact me, uh, if you're in New York and we could uh, look at some normal Dutch warm blood horses, that would be just awesome. So one of the questions about the risk of grazing at grass and hill walking and being out on pasture. And I think that um, hills are a wonderful way to strengthen horses, particularly horses with myofibrillar myopathy. Hill work is terrific. Being able to use cavalettis is terrific. And turning horses out on hills, certainly they work a lot harder than if it's flat. The things that we often recommend is, you know, looking at case by case basis, whether you feel like pasture makes your horse worse. Some people have felt that it has an effect, some people don't. And if pastures are lush, considering whether or not your horse would tolerate a grazing muscle um, and taking the benefit of that type of exercise, but limiting the amount of grass that they can consume by using a grazing muscle. So, hi Barb, it's nice to, nice to hear from you. I remember your horse. And your horse was diagnosed with myofibrillar myopathy and prior to that people were uh, trying muscle relaxants and um, functional stimulation of the muscles as a treatment that didn't seem to work on him. And I don't think that those necessarily work very well for horses with myofibrillar myopathy because of the defect inside the muscle cell and the weakness of the contractile proteins. I think that because of that, um, it's not that the muscles are contracting too hard, it's because the contractile proteins within the cells are weak and therefore um, things like chiropractic adjustments and muscle relaxants and electrical stimulation aren't necessarily going to help horses like that. So if you've got horses that are tying up in the spring, I think if you're thinking about testing, you need to talk to your veterinarian. It depends a little bit on what the breed of your is. So if it's a quarter horse, the first place we normally start is with the genetic testing for type one PSSM. That's readily available um, and can be done. We usually recommend uh, with tying up that the veterinarians evaluate the horse and determine whether or not they have elevations in muscle enzymes like serum CK. In some cases, veterinarians might do an exercise challenge test where they take a blood sample and have you lunge the horse for 20 minutes and then take a, another sample four hours later to see if the CK activity goes up and it's got some underlying subclinical episodes of tying up. So uh, we don't recommend just blanket uh, muscle biopsying horses if tying up, we usually recommend getting the veterinarian involved and ensuring that you've got that diagnosis nailed down first. One of the questions was about Alcar and how does it fit into high fat diets? So um, the carnitine supplements in horses have been given in order to try to ensure that horses have uh, a, an, an amino acid or protein that they need to transport fats into the muscle cells. We've never uh, actually been able to prove one way or the other that horses are deficient in carnitine in their skeletal muscle, but the thought is that it might help transport it. And so my thought with that is if you've tried the supplement and it's not making any difference, it's probably no need to continue utilizing it. Some people have felt like it's uh, made a difference in their horses. A lot of people have felt that it has not. So it's something one might try. And if it's not continuing to work after a couple of weeks, it's something you could try taking away. Another question was, should you retest a horse uh, by muscle biopsy after a few years? I don't think that the changes that we see in the muscle biopsy are going to um, differ over time if they've got a biopsy diagnosis of type 2 PSSM. I think that you really just have to go with trying the diet and exercise recommendations and seeing if it functionally improves your horse's performance, but there's oftentimes no need to retest 
um, the muscle biopsy. Uh, one of the questions was, was my horse tested for myofibrillar myopathy in 2008? In some cases, we've gone back and redone that stain. Um, it can be done on the samples that we've got archived, um, but you're, you're, you could contact us or your veterinarian could contact us and we could see if we've already done that test to figure out if it has myofibrillar myopathy. Uh, would it be more accurate to do more than one biopsy on a horse to determine if it really has type 2 PSM? Um, I don't, I, you know, is it better to do two biopsies rather than one biopsy? I, I don't really think so. One of the things that's really important when you do a muscle biopsy is the quality of the muscle sample that we receive. So what we recommend is that you schedule it on a Monday through Wednesday that the veterinarian gently take the sample so it shouldn't be squished at all. When they've taken the sample, it's put on a piece of gauze that's just slightly damp. It's put in a hard container packed with other gauze so it doesn't bump around. It's put on ice packs and it's shipped directly to the lab so that we can get it within 24 hours. If there's a delay in getting the sample, then that affects the quality of uh, the glycogen that we can read and it affects our ability to make a good diagnosis. So it's really important that the biopsy is handled appropriately. And sometimes you can take a piece of that muscle and put it in formalin so there's some preserved and some fresh. Um, but I don't know that taking more than one muscle is recommended. So one of the questions was, if you've got a PSSM2 horse and their symptoms are managed, are you likely to see it reoccur over time? I think the, the times that that may happen is if you've developed a lameness and your horse has to get rested. So normally if your horse responds well, it's a really good sign. Um, and a lot of times you'll be able to maintain them. The times that you might have a, a bit of a setback is if the horse has to rest because it's got a suspensory issue, for example, and it's on stall rest. Then you have to try to... Um, bring the horse back to exercise. And I think what's worked really well are some of the rehabilitation exercises that can actually be done at rest to keep the horse's muscle mass going. So um, Dr. Hillary Clayton and, and Neural Stubbs have a great book out on maintaining uh, core strength in horses. That's available on amazon.com. And I think doing those exercises in horses that are having to stall rest is really helpful to prevent that kind of thing from happening. One of the questions is about whether heat cycles have an impact, and we really uh, haven't found that there's been an impact on heat cycles in uh, horses with um, myofibrillar myopathy. That doesn't seem to be a problem. And then another question was about magnesium, whether magnesium makes a difference. And I think that's just um, an, on an individual basis. Some horses seem to... Um, do well uh, and improve some of their muscle signs if they receive a magnesium supplement. It doesn't seem like it affects all horses. Some of that might be differences in areas of the country that ha are deficient in magnesium versus areas that aren't deficient in magnesium. So it's, again, one of those things there you might want to try adding a supplement and seeing over a period of a few weeks whether you get an improvement. And if you're not getting an improvement, then there's not necessarily a reason to continue it. So one of the questions was, if a genetic test is found in the future, where would we see that information? Uh, we have a very up-to-date website. If you Google uh, the Neuromuscular Diagnostic Lab and Stephanie Valberg, um, or Michigan State University and Stephanie Valberg, you'll find a lot of the information I've talked about tonight is on that website. And um, whenever we have something new like that, we would definitely let you know. Um, So one of the questions, too, is about moving to a new barn and how that might affect PSSM2. Man, I just moved from uh, Minnesota to Michigan two years ago, and I couldn't believe how stressed out my horse was for such a long time over that particular move. I think that, you know, finding new friends and uh, dealing with new people, all of that in sensitive horses can really have a huge impact on them, whether they have PSSM2 or not. And certainly it takes them a while to settle in, and we have to be really forgiving and understanding of the mental stress that goes on when we, when we move horses from one barn to other. And obviously some horses are more stressy than others. 
So one of the questions was, what can cause a false positive diagnosis of PSSM2? So as I mentioned, reading that muscle biopsy can be fairly subjective. Um, if, you've, if some horses store more glycogen in their muscle than other horses, that might cause a false positive diagnosis. If they're extremely fit, they'll store more glycogen in their muscle. That can cause a false positive diagnosis. If the biopsy sample that we receive is very small, or if the sample has taken too long to get to us, or if it gets crushed, those things can impact whether or not you get um, a false positive um, diagnosis. So then the other one is, do you still recommend injecting hocks and sacroiliac joints? Is that really necessary if you've got a type 2 PSSM diagnosis? I mean, what I recommend in those cases is that you have a, a trusted veterinarian that does a, an evaluation of your horse on an annual basis, and based on that physical exam can tell you whether or not they think that there might be additional issues that are causing your horse to have problems. Because you know, if you've got an athlete, you know that over time, issues arise that, you know, they don't, they will have some sore hocks potentially at some point in time. They might have a sacroiliac that's sore. They might pull a muscle that, and that specific muscle is an issue. They might have a suspensory at some point in time. So I, I believe strongly in having a great relationship with your veterinarian and having annual evaluations of that horse and adjusting for all of those kinds of problems that can arise in athletic individuals um, based on the diagnosis that you get. Oh, you are more than welcome. It's my pleasure for all of the effort. This is um, my lifelong goal is to try to solve some of these problems on horses. And if we feel like we've made a difference, it just makes it all the more worthwhile. And again, if you, if you feel like you've got a group of horses that uh, you might be amenable to having muscle biopsies taken, if you want to send us an email, we can see if we can work something out. All right. Well, it looks like I think we've answered all the questions that have come in through, um, through the queue here. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for this evening. Uh, just a reminder, we will send out a survey to all of you. And uh, when we send out the survey, we'll include a link. Uh, to the recording that we will put up online for uh, those of you to access later and for those that maybe uh, weren't able to make it this evening. So once again, thank you to everyone uh, who has joined us tonight and uh, we hope everyone has a great rest of the evening.